get started with what we are going to learn today. So our class, I don't know if you noticed, shifted from the Rambam <coughs> to Rabbi Yudah Halevi. And um, Rabbi Yudah Halevi lived in Spain. In, he was born in northern Spain, then went to southern Spain. You might say, wow, Rabbi, you know your geography. No, it's not that. It's important to know because northern Spain was Christian and southern Spain was Muslim. And that's where the Jews were spread. No, the Jews were spread in both. But while he was in southern Spain, the Christians kept or were successful in conquering more and more cities in Spain through um, an endeavor called Reconquista, the Reconquest, with the Conquistadores. And that generated a reaction from the Muslims, which brought fighters from North Africa who came to Spain in order to expel the Christians. And this is, we're talking the um, late 11th century. Right? So this is a, about one generation or you know, a little bit more uh, after, before the Rambam. Okay? The Rambam is 1135. This is, we're talking about 1170s, 1180s. And Yudha Levi was in the south. Then he and his friends, colleagues, mentors, you, whatever name you want to use, had to flee and went up north. And he was in, at north, in the north. And then Yudha Levi decided to move to Eretz Israel. He went to... Uh, Egypt. He was in Egypt for a while, moving from two cities, Alexandria to another city. And then eventually, we think, because we don't really know, he made it to Israel, and then maybe then went to Damascus. We're not sure. There is uh, one source that says that he was killed in the old city uh, by uh, someone. So we don't really know how he ended his life. I'd like to believe that he ended it in the best way that he thought he wanted to end it. I just don't know. He wrote the Kuzari as what I would consider a systematic presentation of Judaism. The book has a very, very long name, which is not in the Hebrew. The book is not called the Kuzari. The original, the Arabic, is, I don't remember it. I'll bring it in tomorrow. But it is in the, it's something, the book, in defense of a, dis, excuse me, the despised faith. Okay? So he wrote the book in Arabic because... Most of the Jews at the time that uh, were around spoke Arabic, and so he wrote in Arabic. It was translated later into Hebrew by uh, Rabbi Yehuda Ibn Tibon, who also translated Chavot Alevavot and other books uh, from Arabic to Hebrew. And this book became one of the most famous books from the Middle Ages, outside of Gemara and Chumash commentaries. The book is based on an incident. And the incident is important to some extent to know. Uh, however, if you didn't know it, I don't know that necessarily that would make the book incomprehensible to you. But I will tell you what the book is sort of based about. In the 800s, there was a kingdom in the Caucasus, somewhere where 
you know, the Russian Asia is. And there was a kingdom of people called the Khazars. K-H-A-Z-A-R. Khazar. And it appears from letters that we have from different periods that are earlier than uh, Yudha Halevi that survived in all sorts of places that their king converted to Judaism. And so there was a Jewish kingdom in the world for a few years, a few hundred years. I'm not sure exactly when that ended either. But probably when the Slavs, when the Russians conquered that area. Um, but for a period, there was a Jewish kingdom. And there was correspondence between the king or his court with the Spanish court. Okay? Those letters were written by uh, one of the probably most eminent diplomats in Jewish history. His name is Chazda ibn Shaprut. You can Wikipedia him. There's a good article on him. So Chazda ibn Shaprut was um, a physician by trade, but he was a diplomat for uh, uh, the caliph in Spain, in Seville. Abd al-Rahman. I think it's Abd al-Rahman, the third. And he corresponded with this, with this king. Okay? So Yudha Levi takes this sort of incident, this event in history, and uses it as a backdrop to writing his book. So his book is not a recording of conversations that took place. It is him writing whatever he wants. But he's writing it in a way of a dialogue between two people. And the dialogue begins with the beginning. I was asked, Shaol, Shaal, Shaaluoti, Almashi, Yeshiti, Minata, not Vachuvot, Alachokim, Aleinu. I was asked, says Yudha Halevi, about all of the responses to those who are against our religion. The philosophers, the Christians, all the other groups, right? They all are, are making giving Jews a difficult time, questioning their faith, saying, why do you believe in this? Why do you believe in that? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Aren't you wrong? Don't you know this? Don't you know that? So you know, he says, I remembered what the king of the Khazars learned about Judaism about 400 years ago. Right? So that would put it in the 600s for an 11th century. And here's what happened. The king had a repeated dream. And here's what happened in his dream. An angel appeared to him and said to him as follows. Your intent, your intention is good. God understands that your intention is good, but your actions are bad. This dream repeated itself. And so he's getting a message in his dream that his intention is good, but our, and his actions are bad. And it says, so then he strove and did even a, he was an even better idol worshiper. He strove to worship himself and to offer more sacrifices and do all of the religion that he was in. He did it even with more intent. He was more careful. And what do you think happened? What? And what did the dream say? Your actions are even worse. Your actions are bad. Do you blame the guy? No. Would you blame him, Daniel? I mean, yeah. You would. Yeah. Why? It's, his intentions are good, but his actions are bad. If, if he 
you intend to do something, it, it's not the, your, your intentions that matter. It's what you do. It's what you do that matters. It's, it's, really? Did you ever get a gift? Have I ever had a gift? Yeah. And did you ever hear it's the thought that counts? I've heard it, but I've... I don't really. Right, I mean, you get a tie. You get it. You get it for you know. When I was a kid, I hated that's to get. Like getting half the reward. It's like I don't know. When you when you get a gift, it's when you're a kid and you get clothes as a gift. I wasn't happy. You say, well, you know, it's a th- they thought about you, so they buy you something. It's nice. You should be happy. <laughs> Why couldn't they just buy me what I want? Well, what do you want? I don't know. But he's, he's striving to serve a higher power. He's just yeah. getting, getting the wrong address. Yeah. But he doesn't know any better. I guess you could blame him for doing the same actions harder. Oh. Was his intention. Ah. No, but he thought maybe what he was doing, that in the beginning he would just give money and they would sacrifice themselves. The priest would. So now he said, no, I'll do the sacrifice myself. And it still comes back. He tries this. How would you like that? Like instant answer from above. Like you do something and you hear like. Should I do it again? You do it again. Do it again. No idea what. That's the guy. So he says. V'chol asher ha'mishtadel v'ma'asim ahem haya malach ba'ela ba'layla. So the more he strove, the more work he put in to get a better and better actions, the angel would appear at night and said, Nope, your intent is good, but your actions are bad. And this caused them to investigate beliefs and other religions. And in the end, he converted to Judaism. That's what Yudah Halevi says. Why? Because the arguments of the rabbi answered all his questions. And then he says, And I decided to write the arguments of both sides as they came down. Came down in the sense not written, but naflu happened. And those who know, know, and you know, the smart people will understand what I'm trying to do. Okay. So then he says the following. So when the king saw in his dream that his intention is good, but his actions are not, then he invited a philosopher. Is there any problem with this? As a professional philosopher, uh, I don't think so, but as a rabbi, yes. When you have a dream when an angel comes to you and tells you your intention is good, but your actions are bad, you don't call a philosopher. (laughs) You call your local neighborhood orthodox rabbi, right? And you say, rabbi, I have this dream. My intention is good, but my actions are bad. Check my mezuzah, Rabbi. <laughs> Check my tefillin. The rabbi says, well, you're not wearing yarmulke. Okay, fix that. Let's see how that goes for a while. He calls a philosopher. Makes any sense? It's like the morning. It's not like the 12 o'clock class. Here things make sense. <laughs> Over there, it's... This is sort of more straightforward. He invites a philosopher. And he says the following. He says, philosopher, philosopher. Oh, philosopher. <laughs> what? Is that how you get he says to him, tell me about your... Emulut. No. Tell me about your belief. Tell me about your religion. The philosopher is telling him or he's telling you? No, the king is asking, the philosopher, the king says to the philosopher, I had this dream. Right? This is what happened in my dream. Tell me about your religion. What's your problem with that? What? What's your problem with that? 
You see a problem in that? Why? Wrong. You're correct for modern philosophy. You're not correct in medieval philosophy. And you'll see why. You'll see why. You see, a, a way of thought means it has no conclusions. But in medieval philosophy, they had conclusions. So here's what they say. Says the philosopher, the creator has no will. So he says, so imagine the king says, okay, I have had this dream. This angel is coming to me and tells me that my intentions are you know, good, but my action is bad. So the philosopher says, dude, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because the creator of the universe has no will. He doesn't hate. He's above that with all desires and all intentions. He doesn't have intentions. Why? Because intentions point to a lack. Right? When you have an intention, when you want something, it means you're missing something. That's why you want it. And the reason you want it is because you don't have it. Because if you had it, you don't want it. So if God wants something, that's what he says to the king. So the king's like, but, 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 but I have this dream. Ah, dream, shmeem. Take your medication, you'll be fine. That's essentially the attitude of the philosopher. He goes on, he says, Hashlamat kavanato, shlemut lo. That is, we become complete only when we fill, fulfill our intentions, our needs. God doesn't have a need. Does God need anything? Does God need you? No. Does He want you? No. So get out! <laughs> right? The philosopher is pointing out that the basic assumptions of the king, that God is trying to communicate to him, and that God wants him to do something different than he's doing, saying, God is not like that. But, but, but what about my dream? Dream should mean, I don't know what you're talking about. Eat a light meal at dinner. I don't know. Right? People have, they say that when they eat heavy, they have dreams. So... <coughs> Eat a light meal. You get this? So this is, remember, Yudah Levi is writing to us. To us. And what is he showing us? The arguments that Jews had to face in Spain. So there were philosophers in Spain that would argue against Jews. The Jews say, oh, God wants me to dive in. No, he doesn't. God doesn't want anything. God, da, 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 rip the guy. So he's like, oh, now what do I do? Big problem, isn't it? Because it makes sense, doesn't it? I'm looking at the clock to see, should I give you the answer? Or should I just let it hang till tomorrow? We have plenty of time. I, also, what? We can imagine the <laughs> I don't know, you'd be surprised. So he says, God is more remote, more superior in the philosophers than knowing individual entities. God does not know particulars. Why? Because particulars change. And God doesn't change. God's knowledge doesn't change. And in the knowledge of God, there is no change. He knows the world with you, and He knows the world without you. Right? That's a change. Because you're going to be here for 120 years, and then you're not. So that's a change in His knowledge. Which means you are affecting God. Can you affect God? God's perfect. It's above this. He does not know you. That's what, says, that's what the philosopher says to the guy. He doesn't know you, let alone your intentions and your actions. Let alone hear your prayers. 
It's getting worse, isn't it? He doesn't know any of this stuff. He doesn't see your actions or your movements. And if the philosophers, we the philosophers use, we say that God created you, we only mean it in a metaphorical way. Because he caused the whole universe, but not that he had an intention to create you. It's completely opposite to Judaism. Because in Judaism, we teach that God wanted to create you. <coughs> You're not a mistake. Even if your parents tell you you are a mistake, you're not. It's supposed to be fun. It was. It's hilarious. It's, all the people at home are like, why is the guy banging on the table? I don't know. I'm trying something new. <laughs> God did not intend to create you. He didn't create human beings. Why? Because the world is eternal. No. But the world was never created. The universe was always here. But didn't they just say that God created the universe? He's, that, that's a metaphor. Oh. He's the cause of the universe. Right, so... But cause doesn't mean create. He's the reason for the universe. No. Isn't cause the reason? There are four types of causes, according to Aristotle. What? Shades of gray. No, there aren't fifty shades of gray. <laughs> They're not. I tried. What? I know of two. That's right. Gray. That's right. Two. The gray which is the gray. Right. So the gray that my suit was before it went to the dry cleaners, <laughs> and now the gray that it is. Yeah. What? Don't talk to me about dry cleaners. Right. I, I, I don't understand this. So Aristotle talks about there are four types of, of causes. We're going to get into it later on in the book, so there's no reason to get into this. But you, you, can, have, you can be a cause without being directly connected to the entity. That is to say, your parents caused you. Right? Okay. There was a sperm and an egg, right? And a womb. So in the same way that your parents are your proximate cause, that they are the immediate cause, they're the ones that made you, they provided the genes, the book. But God is the remote cause. Right? So there he's talking about in terms of remote, God caused the universe. It is the sustaining force of the universe. You say, but the causality requires out of nothing. Right? Because you say cause means there was nothing, and then there was something. Right, really cause something to happen. Ah. But the principle of nature is nothing comes out of nothing. Right. Which means there had to have been something. Right. So God. something always... No. Sorry! No. God is not a something. God is God. Right? Take a lap. This is just poor thinking to say God is something. So everything came out of God. Matter. Matter. Yeah. Right? Right, yeah. Molecules, yeah. energy, whatever it is. So energy takes space. Right. God doesn't. Right. So God cannot be something. God creates space. Right. He according to the philosopher that we're learning. I don't like we him. are what? I don't like him. You don't like him. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Wait till what you want to see what the rabbi does with him? I'm, 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 I'm really excited. Because the rabbi tears him apart. I'm sure he does. But you have to get to, you have to wait for it. You hate waiting. Instant gratification, man. Instant, yeah. Okay, I'm sad. I'm not in an instant gratification. I can wait. I can know it. Uh, that's true. That's true. That's true. We should probably, for tomorrow, have the Arabic, to read the Arabic while we... Just in case this is going to be on public cable access, they're going to be like, "What?" But you? and then like some Muslim guy go, "Arabic? Ooh, Jews? What are they saying?" <laughs> <laughs> Honey, come here! You won't believe this. Jews from Israel are speaking in Arabic, and they're talking about our religion. We all know Arabic. 
I agree. You should know all languages, why not? But just know Hebrew well. It's work, work on Hebrew. So he says, the universe is eternal. And a person only comes from another person. You came from your parents, who came from their parents, who came from their parents, who came from... So then you would say, well, where did the first human came? They would laugh at you and say, what first human? Where was he born? Was there a womb for him? He was born out of the mother of the earth. They would be like, are you kidding me? You believe this? That's what the philosophers say. All human beings come from, all, from human beings. All chickens come from chickens. Where did the egg come from? From a chicken. Where did that chicken come from? From an egg. Where did that egg come from? A chicken. Well, can that go forever? Yes. Universe was always like this. It was always like this. Science doesn't allow that. But back then, 500 years ago, that was possible to theoretically think that. Today, it's not so simple to say. Okay? But you can entertain the idea of, yeah, we're just, we're just continuing as, and God caused all this. But, but there was nothing once. No. There was always something. Okay. Now, so he says, in a human being, is a combination of forms and and uh, and humors and different morals that he receives from his father and his mother and other his and other um, uh, family members, and he is affected by the air, the atmosphere, by the land, by the foods, by the water, right, by the environment. So this is one of the early sources, one of the earlier sources, that the environment affects who we are. Environmental factors, including, you would love this, the spheres and the stars. All of them affect us. But all of it goes back to the first cause, but not because it was intended by God. Not at all. He simply emanated this from himself, and then there was a second cause, and then a third cause, and a fourth cause, and then there were lots of other causes until you have this chain of causes until you get to Eliezer. That's how it works. And he says that that's how you have to understand the universe is eternal, it was always here. God operates by necessity, not by will. And God emanates or emanated the universe, or the first, cause, second cause, which emanated the second cause, and he says, and that's it. And some people are more perfected than other people. But that's all it has to do. That's what, how it happened. The philosopher is the epitome of human society because he became perfected with his moral scientific and artistic uh, qualities, that is to say, uh, practical qualities. He can build stuff, he can analyze stuff, he can draw uh, blueprints, right, those sort of things. He can study the universe and science, and he's a, he's a very good human being. He's got morals. And he's not missing anything from his perfection. But the way that a human being becomes perfected we're all born with it, with the potentiality to be perfect. How do we reach that perfection? What do you think he would say? It's very simple. What? Where does knowledge come from? How do you get knowledge? Learning. Learning. That's what he says. Learning. Through learning, you achieve higher and higher level of perfection. That's it. And the most perfect human being, philosopher, is able to connect. Listen to this. This is philosophy in the 12th century, 11th century. 
the philosopher can connect with the species of the divine world. So there are two realms. There's the physical realm and metaphysical realm. Physical realm is the earth. Metaphysical is above the earth. Okay? So the philosopher, the perfected human being, is able to transcend the physical, the earthly world and connect to a light that is called active intellect. And the person that is sitting in front of you is one of the few experts in the world on the active intellect. If you Google me on Amazon, I wrote a book on, on this. So we're not going to get into it because if I teach Buy you... the book, of course. No, because there's no really... No, no. The, because the, we are going to learn enough about the active intellect as he talks about it, we'll, you'll see what, what, it, what this is. Um, but it is uh, sort of a, a, an amazing idea that uh, was in philosophy uh, for a few hundred years, for a few, close to, let's say, a thousand years, more than a thousand years, about probably 1,500 years, and then disappeared. I'm bringing it back, baby. I'm bringing it back. Making it come back. Get the t shirt. So he says that the human, the, the, this perfected human being, the philosopher, is able to connect to this light that is called the active intellect. And the human intellect and the intellect, the active intellect, become one. And there is transfer of information. It's almost that, like, it's very interesting. Um, that our mind is like a modem and we connect to the server which is the active intellect and we download the information from the active intellect that's how it really works but in order to hook up to connect to the active intellect you have to reach a certain level of physical perfection that is to be healthy, to be, you know, moral perfection and intellectual perfection. Right? So once you have the code, right, to sign in, to connect, then you can do it. And then you, your intellect receives information. They used to call truths. Absolute truths. That's the only thing that this, this, the, the active intellect has. It sounds bizarre, doesn't it? It's like, what are they talking about? But when we get into it, and I'll go through what the active intellect is in terms of why the philosophers came up with it, it is in order to explain a very, very interesting anomaly, which is, how do we know what we know? Where do our ideas come from? Where does it come from? Bread. That's easy. The Midrash tells us, God taught us. But, like, you know, you're sitting and all of a sudden an idea pops in your head. You're like, oh, where did that come from? How does that work? How does that work? Like, you learn, uh, you know, a theorem in geometry or, you know, that, like a. The, interior, the sum of interior a angles of a right triangle is 180. How do you know that? How do you know that the whole cannot be greater than the sum of the parts? Some people say, what? But if you listen to the words, how can people know, Danny, that time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana? What? Right? Isn't that good? So he receives knowledge into his brain, into his mind. I shouldn't say brain. 
So that's a separate issue. And that's the idea. And he says that the human mind really becomes a tool, like a Plato, for the, for the act of intellect to shape. So it is able to send universal truths into our mind. And those abstract concepts are in our mind, and we can know them. Okay? That's how he explains them. Now imagine the king who's asking himself, I had a dream. And this guy is talking about connecting to the mothership with my mind, with my... What? What is the king trying to... What is the philosopher trying to explain to him? That his dream doesn't have hold any water. Correct. The philosopher says the mechanism of how your mind works is as follows. And what you're telling me is it doesn't make any sense. It's all in your imagination. Call Bellevue. Order a table for two. Bellevue is the mental hospital in New York. So in New York, you say, Bellevue, table for two. That's what the philosopher is telling the king. You never want to call the king crazy. Why not? He'll kill you. No, he wouldn't. No, I no he brought him in. All right, let's stop here. Leave it for Mincha. We'll continue. Thank you.